Focus Tire Information Whiskey 21530. Wind 060 at 5. Mike Juliet, this is Archer Radar Contact. Hazardous weather information from Minnesota available on flight service frequency. You've dialed in the Flying Midwest Podcast. Connecting aviators from across America's heartland. Sharing news, information, and events from around the region. Calling Nancy Vincent, Dan Ogata, Roger, turn left heading 070, runway 9 crew for takeoff. Sit back, relax, and join our crew for some hangar talk as we discuss a wide variety of regional aviation topics. And now, from our home at the Anoka County Blaine Airport, our checklist is complete and we're ready for departure for another episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. What is going on, everyone? Jim here with the Flying Midwest Podcast. So happy you're able to join us. On this episode, we are so excited to be joined by Rob Ryder, aviator, air show announcer, host of Sporty's pilot training videos, and aviation podcaster. He talks with us about an exciting career in aviation and the great people he's met along the way. So strap in and let's take off into this episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. Hey, Jim. Hey, Trevor. How's it going? Oh, it's going. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Getting ready for Christmas? We are getting ready for Christmas. Uh, I'm not sure how the travel situation is going to look in the next couple of days here, but uh, got a lot of blowing snow out there tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, everybody's closing. Oh, yeah. And then they, and then they extended the uh, the blizzard warning up to the southern Twin Cities. Uh-huh. And it's like, it's like the apocalypse. I was saying something to someone at work today about, you know, it, it seems like every time it snows and gets a little windy up here, um, everyone makes a big deal out of it now. Then they told me how strong the winds are supposed to be over the next couple of days. I'm like, ooh, that sounds pretty nasty. And then they said, I thought you just said it was going to be snow and wind. I'm like, eh, well, you might have a point this time. So we'll see what Christmas has in store for us. It's going to be a crappy, uh, crappy mode of transportation. Good luck to you, general aviation guys, because uh, you'll be you'll have more reliability than the airlines. You think so? Because I think you're just going to be grounded. That it, but you'll be reliably grounded until your airport is open again. Yeah, right. Uh, but I think we should cover the elephant in the room real quick. Yeah, Maddie's not here. Maddie is not here. I'm not trying to say that Maddie's an elephant either. That wasn't very nice. <laughs> <laughs> the elephant in the room implies that we are missing somebody, and that's very noticeable. We are missing Maddie, aren't we? Sort of. No, I miss Maddie. <laughs> I, mean, I do. I do too. So Maddie is at home with her family, starting her Christmas festivities a little early. So, um, just me and Trevor this time. Back to the roots. How about that? We're getting close to our first anniversary, and we wanted to take it back to OG. Right. What a, what a more fitting way than just the two of us again. <laughs> Maddie will be back uh, next time. I hope. She better be. Well, and if she's not, we'll just shame her publicly on a podcast. That's right. That she'll never hear because she's not going to listen to it. Which which we already do. So, I mean... Right. So, instead of news and events... Oh, I want to back up. Oh, you skipped something. Maybe it's intentional. Is you don't want to talk about flying? <laughs> I mean, I do want to talk about flying. I do love to talk about flying, but uh, it just seems so weird. Okay, now we have to unpack that. What's weird about flying? It's weird being in a seat behind the pilots, throwing switches, and doing performance calculations. There's a bunch of other stuff while they're sitting there, you know, 300 feet above the deck, weaving between towers and birds and other airplanes and fun stuff like that. It's just weird. You have to have a lot of trust in your pilots. Yeah, I bet. But hey, this is a new experience for you, so. It is. I'm not at the controls, and now I'm actually starting to feel a little more comfortable low level. There you go. So Minnesota's had a lot of bad weather over the past. We have. Like, like the stretch of weather's just been horrible. And my first flight in the seat for my local flying was with my commander. I'm sitting there looking out the windows. I'm looking at the uh, the windshield wipers, which, you know, we don't have good ice detection on our airplanes, so we have to use our good judgment. And our judgment is actually uh, looking at the windshield wiper and seeing the, the ice accumulate. Okay. Like, every time you blink your eye, it's like, that much bigger. We we're in uh, pretty heavy icing, and got to see what the air, airplane can do with uh, with a with a ton of ice. 
See, I kind of thought you said that, you know, the aircraft's ice detection was going to be, you take the flight engineer and have them pop their head out the window up top. So, <laughs> odd, oddly enough, there is a procedure for that. I bet there is. Not in flight. Okay, fine. Our airplane was in the hangar, and it was snowing outside. We opened up the hangar, pulled the airplane out. It was nice 70 degrees over the weekend. Get ready to go crank engines, and we are less than five minutes from takeoff, which is the requirement per, per our, our regs. And it's kind of funny. So the the instructor that I'm with to get me checked out in the airplane, we go before takeoff checklist, and one of them is start pressurizing the airplane. And we have an overhead hatch that you have to open up and pop. It's kind of like a, you know, it's it's a, what they call a plug-type door. Basically, the door is is bigger than the hole so it can seal well apparently i had a lot of pressure on the airplane already and um we had to depressurize the airplane pop open the hatch he had to go stick his head out with the american flag not really um <laughs> stick his head out do the gopher check make sure we didn't have any ice or anything like that and then we were able to take off huh see so there we go from me being a smart ass to there being a real thing it is a real thing <laughs> so you've been doing a lot of flying how about you i've done no flying um, on account of the weather you just talked about, um, my plane is on a maintenance, but it has been just, it's either cloudy or too cold or I'm busy and I just haven't been up. Is it actually fixed? Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel bad because my airplane is sitting alone. Silver lining on this. It's sitting alone, but it's not sitting under eight inches of snow right now. Oh, Arkansas is getting snow. Oh, damn it. See, I thought I had a silver lining for you and I got nothing now. All right. Silver lining is, I might be. I might leave Christmas night and fly down and go pick it up and fly it home. Uh, Christmas night, you say? Oh. Merry Not Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> With the red and white airplane. There you go. I like Santa Claus. I was going to say, you're going to do a little Santa Claus flight? Oh, oh, oh. Well, oh. you said not Christmas Eve, so. Yeah, well, I mean, Christmas Day, I mean. It, it... But you'll be flying through the air. It's something, it's red, and you'll be bringing joy to somebody. It might just be you, but. <laughs> with, with a big red flashy light on top of the fin? Yeah. Like Rudolph? Yep. There you go. There you go. Hey, there we go. We Now we're cooking with gas. We got it figured out. So, because it is in the middle of winter. It is. And we have an awesome guest. Oh, yeah, we do. We're not going to do news and events this time. Skip the news and events, so more content for you. That and, I'll be candid, I looked for news and events, and it's the middle of winter, like Trevor said, and there's just a whole lot of <laughs> nothing. Let's focus on Christmas and so people can enjoy their aviation stuff. Wrap your presents in your sectional shards. And... I wonder if Maddie's uh, products are selling stationary for Christmas. That is a good question. Too bad we don't have Maddie here to, to answer that. I know. And I would try to plug this a little bit more. Um, Aviatrix Airmail, for all of you who are curious, I'd say go order stuff before Christmas, but she's already home, so I'm not sure if she's going to get it to you before Christmas. However, sure. here's what we'll do a set of news and events. Here's a quick um, unsolicited, unrequested advertisement for Aviatrix Airmail. Have you ever wanted to get some stationery or any other type of cards or envelopes, what have you? Aviation related, made on a sectionals, by hand, with love. And care. I care. Hey, check out Aviatrix Airmail. You will have a handmade yeah. piece of... Um, history. History. Because <laughs> the charts are history? You know what they are. They're <laughs> old charts. They're old charts. They're history. You could give that unique stationery a new life. No, give that old sectional a new life and stationary. There, oh, I like that. There you go. And you'd be the talk of the town with all your friends and family. So stop on down at Maddie's Aviatrix Airmail Store. <laughs> and now and now only because she's not here to authorize it or decline it, 100% um, off all products. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas to all and to all good night. Okay, that's not true. Um, at any rate, check out Maddie's stuff. She works really hard on it. She does a really good job and um, helps support her a little bit. That's right. Yeah, I was going to say, Maddie, that'll be $17 for the advertising piece. So speaking of Maddie's stationery and bringing new life to old sectional charts, our next guest has reinvented himself multiple times over for the benefit and the amusement of the aviation community. What do you think, Jim? I think that I am incredibly excited to introduce to all of you the one, the only, Rob Ryder. So Mr. Rob Ryder began his career in television and music in the 70s and early 80s and was given the opportunity to be an announcer at the Dayton Air Show in Ohio. It led him into a career of being one of the most well-known and sought-after announcers in the air show circuit. 
He's even received a prestigious Sword of Excellence Award from the International Council of Air Shows. Rob has also been the face and voice of the Sporties Pilot Shop instructional videos since the 80s as well. Whether it's from learning about your private pilot knowledge to learning the Garmin G1000, Rob was there. Rob has also been heavily involved throughout the years with the Blue Angels and the United States Air Force Thunderbirds and their announcing. Pretty cool uh, life, if you ask me. Absolutely. And he's getting into audiobooks now. Yes. So I've been hyping it up quite a bit. We are incredibly excited to have the legendary Rob Ryder with us on this episode. Oh, you don't like that already. I don't <laughs> understand legendary. Hi, you guys. Hi, Jim. Hi, Trevor. I, I really, when somebody says legendary, I think it's somebody who's supposed to be like really old. and <laughs> Like and, a, like a Scott Crossfield or, you know. Yeah, somebody well, who's really accomplished something. <laughs> Well, I, I feel mean, like you, you have in your own have. right. So, <laughs> well, not not to the extent he did. I'm just uh, an entertainer who got to love aviation and music and everything else. So I, I don't know. I I don't know about legendary, but um, uh, maybe a legend in my own mind. Hey, there you go. Yeah. That works too. <laughs> <laughs> to get us started, we'd like to do a series of five questions or so with our guests to get them warmed up, get us warmed up, and to get into the swing of things. So so in other words, I have to do the gauntlet before we get into it. Yes, it's a little right? bit of a gauntlet, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Trevor does judge just a little bit based on your answers. So, As long as the answer's not Top Gun or Tom Cruise, and I'm fine. <laughs> All right, for the first question we have for you, uh, what is your favorite air show venue? Wow, very, very tough uh, because I got a bunch of favorites, and, and I'm going to give you a couple of different examples, one of which is Owensboro, Kentucky. It's a big air show in a small town along the Ohio River. We fly down there, park the airplane, they stick my airplane in a hangar. We get our rental car, take it down to the hotel on the river. We stay there. The next morning, we brief there. After the briefing is over, we walk across the parking lot to the convention center, walk in the main doors, go up four flights on an elevator, walk the length of the uh, convention center to a covered deck overlooking the river where I announce the show. When it's nice. done, I close up, go back down, walk across the parking lot to the hotel, and I'm done. And I, I so I really like that show. My wife really likes that show. She's a runner, so she can run along the river walk there, and, and okay. so she loves it down there. Uh, it's hard not to like Miramar, because it's the biggest sure. military show in the world. It's hard yeah. not to like Pensacola because it's the home of the Blue Angels now and uh, yeah. doing that show for 13, 14 years. Jones Beach on Long Island, the new, that New York air show at Jones Beach. Oh, yeah. I've been doing that for 18 years. It, it's just a gr great venue to do it. But over top of all of the places, it's the people with whom I've become friends. So that then will include Dayton as my home show. It'll include Thunder Over, Over Michigan for the Yankee Air Museum with Kevin Walsh, the Duluth Air Show with Ryan Kern, and sure. so many others like that that are that are shows that are just, you know, because they're buds, you know. Uh, people oh, have yeah. said that they got into the air show business because of the airplanes. They stay in it because of the people, and I have certainly found that to be the case for me. I'm looking forward to my very first air show as a C-130 flight engineer. Where? Minnesota. So the uh, the 130 unit down in uh, Minneapolis. Will you come to Duluth this summer to do flybys and stuff? Fingers are crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers are crossed. <laughs> That'd be cool. I said, ladies and gentlemen, coming from the right, here comes Trevor. Just hold <laughs> on to your hats. We don't know which way the airplane's going to go. <laughs> hey, there you go. And that's very true because Trevor has no control. That's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're just the FE. You just make that's sure right. the engines work. That is a big part and of the flying, though. The, the yeah. engines should work. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they should work. <laughs> the second question, it is rapid fire response question. <laughs> Rabbit hole. This might be tough for you to answer, but I'm going to put you on the spot anyway. Oh. Favorite air show act. Whoa. <laughs> That's that might put you in a tough spot with some performers out there. Yeah, we should be careful. Very well, it could. <laughs> I tell you, one of the ones I like the best is Redline. Okay, where are you? And when it was John Thacker and Ken Reader, uh, John was unfortunately killed four years ago. 
past October at Culpeper, Virginia. But those are the guys, those, he and Ken were responsible for me reigniting my love for flying. And they used to be with Team Aerodynamics and they did, didn't live in the area. They lived up in Cincinnati near, here in my area. And when the guy who's 182 that I had been flying for a long time decided to sell it, I figured my flying days were over and I was kind of okay with that. And they said, well, why don't you get an RV? I said, well, gosh, it only seats two people. They said, well, how long, how often do you put more than two people in the plane? Sure. I said, mm, not very often. And then they, I said, but it only carries 100 pounds of bags. He said, pack small, pack soft, pack light. Okay. And then John went to work on finding an airplane. And he looked at several. I flew, test flew one here in Cincinnati. Uh, it was not ready for prime time because of a couple of construction issues with which John took exception. Found one in Scottsdale. I bought it. He inspected it, test flew it, we flew it home, it went into his shop. Five weeks later, it came out with the full Garmin panel, the dual G3X wow. Touch, a G5 backup, G GFC 500, a GTN 650, extra radio, remote transponder. And then a few days later, on October 31st of 2016, Ken Reader gave me my IPC in that airplane. And three days later, my wife and I jumped in the plane to fly down to Jacksonville in Pensacola. And uh, we were in the clouds the first day, you know, and Bob wow. was good. So they, those guys have, they are special friends of mine. And Adam Baker has been flying with, with Ken Reader a lot, but also Ken's son, Austin, has been flying oh. with him. And so that's, he's working his way down. I think he's got a 500 foot waiver now. And the, the those guys, are very, very special friends. It's hard not to love Michael Goulian because he is a spe special friend as well. I always love the Geico Sky Typers, but again, it's not the airplanes, it's the people. And it's Larry yeah. and all the gang that was in uh, th that were in the Sky Typers. Chris Thomas and Tom Daly and uh, the, whole, the whole group of guys. And then, of course, the Blues and Thunderbirds with whom I am very close. And the Golden Knights, so. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I don't think I could pick one particular favorite, but if I had to put one at the top of the list, it would be because of what the friendship I have on an ongoing basis. That's kind of what it is, Jim. That's, I would say, red line. A great answer. And the history behind it is awesome. This one is an odd question, um, and you may have your own um, way of doing things when you're at air shows, but oh. do you have a favorite air show food? Some West kind of Coast? I have to hit in and out. Okay. Ooh, yes. Um, New Orleans, I didn't get there this year, but there is a place in Bell Chase off the base called Salvo Seafood. Best catfish ever had in my life. Huh. Um, other than that, I have some favorite restaurants here in Cincinnati that my wife and I, Jill and I, love to go to. And we think it's the best ever. But those those are two things that I can think of in terms of air show food that that uh, I really really dig. I'm not going to argue with you with in and out. Is there anyone in aviation who you haven't met that you would like to meet? Oh, wow. We ask very profound questions. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, I've met Joe Kittinger. I've met Harrison Ford briefly up at Oshkosh. It was so funny. I'm up there in the announcer stand. I'm wearing a flight suit, and he comes up, so hi, I'm Harrison Ford. And I go, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you are. <laughs> I felt like a doofus. Uh, but, I mean, he didn't assume anything. It was pretty cool, I thought. Gosh, I met Kevin LaRosa from Maverick. I won't say Top Gun, Maverick. <laughs> and and uh, Devotion. I met Jaeger on a couple of occasions. I met Hoover on a few occasions. Ah, uh, golly. Maybe. Honest to good. I, I mean, I've been backstage and hung out with, uh, actually, just one-on-one -on -one with John Travolta at the Living Legends oh, of Aviation. Wow. He and I just <laughs> sat and talked for about 15 minutes. And uh, But I, I think I'd like to meet Tom Cruise. I honestly do. <laughs> <laughs> and see if he took the sporties course before he got his private. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did, but... I was going to say, you're talking about this moment that you, you met Harrison Ford and you felt like a doofus, and you're like, hey, I know who you are. Um, that's how I felt the first time we talked on the phone. 
They're like, yeah, I know, yeah, I know this voice. This is Rob Ryder, and we, I've listened to your voice for years. So mm -hmm. I felt like a doofus. That's right. Well, please, <laughs> no, you need, you needn't. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that how many people at air shows that I get to meet who have taken the course. They want to get a picture taken after the show, and I think it's, it's the coolest thing ever. Guy said. Yeah, you've been in my bedroom. I said, no, no. <laughs> I wasn't going to take it that far, but. <laughs> well, so I rest assured, you weren't in my bedroom. Good. But you were with me several times going to and from work. Well, and now they've got it so you can play audio only in the app. You know, if you're mm -hmm. driving along, you can review just audio-wise the lessons. So the last question I have for you in our quick, <laughs> I love, yeah. this happens every time we record, we go, yeah, we got these fast five questions and half hour later, we're still working through them. Um, <laughs> Trust us, we're professionals. Yeah. This is the airplane movie question. Um, what is your least favorite airplane movie? Probably Iron Eagle. Yes. Compared to the drama of Top Gun, Top Gun Maverick, go back in time to the high and the mighty, go to comedy with airplane, and oh, Iron yeah. Eagle, a cassette machine, and an F-16 <laughs> strapped to a leg. Uh -huh. You got to tell me, at 9 Gs, there ain't no cassette machine in the world that could handle 9 Gs and still be playing in tune. They go... Bruh, bruh, bruh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. That's funny. I'm with you on that one. I don't pull Gs worth a darn, so... <laughs> I've had two rides with the Blues, one a number four and one a number five during a practice demo. Oh, four years apart, and uh, I'd do it again, but I was really sick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exhausted. Mm -hmm. Exhausted. Oh, well, thanks for playing along with the first set of questions here. Um, <laughs> the only one I was short on was I. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's all right. It's still plenty to work with. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about before we started here, kind of the timeline. So you started in TV. Did you go to the air shows right after that, or was it Sporties first? No, it was the Sporties was later. I, okay. I started I in high school. I was in musical theater, and I got to college. Before I went to college, I toured with a musical group that, that you guys won't even know, but the group was very big in the latter days of vaudeville, all the way through the heydays of radio and the early days of television, an organization, chorus and orchestra, Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians. And I was a singer, and uh, we recorded for a major label. I played guitar on the record and sang on the record, and we toured. We did one-nighters all over the country, and I toured for a year. And then I went to the University of Cincinnati, and I, I was asked to sing at the 150th birthday dinner of the University of Cincinnati based on my professional experience with Fred Waring, I was discovered, if you will, by uh, one of the cast members of a show called The Bob Braun Show. And hmm. I wound up working there for 13 years from 1970 to 1983, when in 1978, the show did a remote. We were on in Cincinnati, Dayton, Indianapolis, and Columbus. You know, like eight-piece band, singing everything, all sorts of stuff. And it was just wonderful. Well, we took the show on a remote in 1978 to what was then the Dayton Air Fair. And I thought it was 1979 until a, a friend of mine from the cast, she showed me the picture. It was 78. There's Bob Braun. And next to Bob Braun is Art Scholl. And on the other side of Art Scholl, I didn't know who it, was, so who it was. So I put it up on Facebook and I felt like a freaking idiot. It was Happy <laughs> Boyington. Wow. <laughs> because that was the, the second year of Black Sheep Squadron or Baba Black Sheep. And there yeah. was a Corsair flying around. Well, as a ham radio operator, I also had friends up there who asked me if I would like to volunteer as a communicator. I said, yes. So that started the 79. Eventually, it led to getting Mike Time and uh, Bill Bordelow, ICAST member number four, one of the founders of the International wow. Council of Air Shows, started giving me some stuff to do and encouraged me. And so I joined ICAST in 1995 while I was doing other work. Then in 2006, when my wife was in remission with cancer at the time, uh, I walked away from the church job where I was working and chased after the air show business. And it was the best thing we ever did. Gail and I had a year and a half, the last year and a half of her life, uh, where I wasn't working 50 weeks a year. And uh, so it was, it was really good. My wife passed away in 07. And I remarried in 2012. And now my wife, Jill, likes to come to air shows with me, but she'll sleep in and just come to the show one day. <laughs> so then 
after this, my television days were over in 83, it was 87. I was still running an audio business and doing corporate and church singing, uh, entertainment, uh, for corporate events and stuff. Uh, that's when I got the sporties thing happened in 87. By 1990, they started paying me a little bit at Dayton and I lived for that week. It's, I love the smell of jet fumes in the morning or what? Oh, yeah. That yeah. Line. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the smell of Jeff Fuel in the morning. Could not get enough. Now I know the people who fly him, and I can't get enough. They're such good people. So Dayton was really your kind of springboard for, oh, for all yeah. these air shows, then. Oh, yeah. Dayton was that. that I got encouraged by those folks. And, and once I joined ICAST, John Cudahy, the president of the International Council of Air Shows, had taken the Sporties course. And in 1999, he asked if I would emcee the closing night banquet, which I did. Wow. And then we did it at Opryland. And... It went exceptionally well and got me exposure that I would not have gotten otherwise. Sean Tucker was also instrumental in in spreading the word about me and, and got me on at Jones Beach and Salinas. And uh, when I started getting his uh, stamp of approval, plus the time I was getting on stage and obviously getting a stamp of approval from the from the International Council of Air Shows that turned things to a positive. I so I said to John Cuddy once, I don't think an announcer could make a living at this business. But it turns out uh, I, I did. I have. And I do. And it's good. That's inspirational. Wow, I hope. It's, I mean, <laughs> it is. Well, you know, I'm still just a private instrument rated single engine land pilot. And I'm not, you know, I've not had our airplane upside down. Ken Reeder taught me how to fly formation. I can get tucked in within about five feet of, of his RV. It's a boatload of work and a wonderful challenge. But mm -hmm. the, the idea of being able to get from one place to another safely in an airplane that's well outfitted and well, say huh? experimental, but you and I know that it's hardly an experiment with 11,000 RVs or so flying around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The serious performance without the ticket yeah. price. But I remember talking to Jack Pelton one day, and his, his remark was, the experiment is over. Mm -hmm. I, it's the perfect, the RV-7A is a perfect airplane for us. And interestingly, I do the Duluth show, and part of the deal is that Cirrus, as a sponsor, will come to pick me up in Cincinnati and take me up to Duluth. <laughs> so I've got now about 10 hours of duel in an SR-22, and... Now about six hours in the vision jet. Mm -hmm. wow. And because I have a full Garmin suite in my airplane, or our airplane, I should say, yep, and yep. because it's all Garmin in the vision jet, and because the nose wheel is freewheeling, I can handle the taxing. <laughs> yep. You know, I can keep it on the center line relatively well. So uh, flying the vision jet was really really easy. So had you been flying before you got into the air shows or was this something that you picked up after you got into the air show business that you wanted to fly on your own or how did that come about? When I was a kid, my dad, after the war, soloed, but he couldn't get a private license because he was colorblind, but we still built model airplanes and stuff. And so I always loved aviation, although music became my overall passion and, and vocation. And when I was on the TV show, I was able to line up a ride with the, fl uh, with the Thunderbirds, a flight from Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome wow. to Youngstown, Ohio. It was about a 45-minute ride. And <laughs> when I came home, I said to my wife, this is unbelievable. I got to get a pilot's license. And so my best friend, a buddy, named, buddy of mine named Jim Fiorito, Jim had a private pilot's license and a commercial license and an instrument rating, and he was flying his boss around in a bonanza all the time. And Jim taught me attitude flying. He really taught me how to fly. He's not an instructor. When I started, I had uh, an instructor by the name of Margot Brooks. She no longer uh, instructs, but she's still around here in, Cin in the Cincinnati area. I soloed in four and a half hours and got my private in 43 and a half hours and got a nice. 98 on my written. Nice. So, but given the fact that I was also raising five kids, it took me a long time to get an instrument rating. Now I'm over 2,000 hours, but fully 25 to 30% of that flying has taken place between 2016 when I got my RV to now. So I really put the hours on it. You're well known for sporties. I mean, heck, I used the sporties 
program back when I was in Afghanistan. So you're very well known for that. How did you get into that? For me, it was when they started their video department, the guy came up, Lou Sims came from Chattanooga, Tennessee, started looking around Cincinnati. To, he asked around, is there a pilot in this town who can read? And somebody mentioned by name. That was it. And so I read <laughs> for him. I went and did a screen test for him. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, we're going to start next week. What? So he lost the screen test, and that was the beginning of the longest-running single relationship I've had with any company since I've been alive. And wow. it has just gotten better and better. We started on VHS. Then they went to DVDs, and they figured out a way to trick the menu system on DVDs so they could go back and 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 have it be somewhat interactive. And then mm -hmm. they went to uh, the uh, video courses on, on online and now with the apps and stuff. Brett Kobe and the gang there in the video department have just done an amazing amount of work. They're, I think their graphics are great. And when, when rules change, when uh, equipment changes, when graphics and computer, the technology of computers changes, of all those, when all that kind of stuff happens, we keep redoing stuff. And I, heck, I did a, a thing yesterday uh, for the four flight course about. 12, 13 minutes uh, uh. worth of stuff just yesterday. One of the things that I have as a skill that worked is that I can use a wireless ear prompter. I've got a, a little digital voice recorder, and they give me the script the night before or the morning of the shoot, and I read everything in reverse. So the last thing that I record is the first shot we're going to do it during the day. So then I can erase, and it automatic will, automatically will re-cue to the beginning of the cut. And I put it in my hip pocket. I have a wireless loop around my neck and a wireless earpiece that fits deep in my left ear. And you can't see it. And they say, ready, rolling. And I press it. And I give a three count. I said, three, two, one. And I hear it here. And it comes out there. Nice. And it, and it has made things very efficient for us. Wow. Teleprompters. Uh, they don't have to redo that. Now, occasionally, I will... Man, I get 10 or 11 takes on something. I just keep screwing something up, you know. It, there's there's usually one of those in every shoot. But we knock off a lot of stuff. Plus, the guys at Sporties, they don't want to have a lot of talking head. Mm -hmm. They want the airplanes. Yeah, oh, sure. Everyone wants the airplanes. So I'm there to say, how you doing? And then get out of the way. Yep. <laughs> and the rest of it I do on the other side of this glass here. I'm in the control room here in the, in the booth. It's... Uh, that's where I do the critical voice work. That's incredible. There, there, so there's a lot of science that goes into that and a lot of engineering and production that goes into a lot of that to just get it just right. Yes, and it's a small department, but they have gone outside for people to make the apps work and make it compatible so it, online with uh, Mac, Windows, Android, iOS, um, whatever it happens to be, Roku, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I can't believe they do it for Roku now. They sure do. And I've got the Sporties channel on our Roku set. And I, you know, I'll turn it on every once in a while and watch because they're shooting all 4K now. And and it ends up being 1080 by the time it gets streamed. But then that means that they can set a static shot on me and zoom on me electronically while I'm on camera or move me to a little different framing and stuff to make it look different and Brett Kobe and his team are absolutely fantastic at what they do with the latest and greatest and the supercomputers that those guys have built up and uh, and they do it with just like three guys it's really amazing that's incredible I mean it's the best selling pilot training series on the planet yeah you know from little Cincinnati yeah. Ohio yeah I'm very blessed to be part of that team and to be friends with them as well. You know, again, the airplanes got me there. It's the friends that have kept me there. Yep. Sure. But the Sporties video series, so did it start out as just a private pilot thing and then expand it to the instrument and the other ratings, or the progression of that? First two videos I did, one was So You Want to Fly Helicopters. <laughs> so not even a private pilot video? No, not yet. And oh, then wow. we did Choosing the Right Flight Instructor. Ooh. And then we did the private series, and then the instrument, and then other things. And heck, we did flying the blimp. I was never anywhere near a blimp when I did the on-camera <laughs> for that video. And the seaplane video, I didn't do anything. 
Uh, I was no nowhere near that. But the uh, four flight video and uh, that continues to be a really good seller for oh, uh, that. Yeah, for uh, for sporties, and so that's good. And we have a G one thousand training video. If I had to get in an airplane with a G one thousand, I would have to spend some time in the training device at sporties to relearn the G one thousand, because I am so spoiled by the second generation operational characteristics of the, of the G3X that to go back and do chapters and dig down into the uh -huh. G1000 it would it would probably uh it would be uh, something that would be a little bit more difficult yeah yeah so of those series that you've done do you have a favorite at all oh i think it's the instrument i think so uh, jim because it's i i think the instrument ticket is the most important rating you can get because it teaches you enough about whether to be more decisive, more careful, and more more on top of what weather means to a light plane. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Th so I think the instrument series would be my favorite, although I'm, you know, they, whatever they want, I'm very, very happy to just be part of the team and do whatever they want. So, you know, I do something almost every week for them. It could be short, could be a few paragraphs, just an update. Uh, we actually did one on the E6B on the whiz wheel. Oh, we really? We did an update on that, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier that you guys are constantly updating this stuff. Yeah, they're updating all the time, Jim, because one of the first updates was when we went from shooting the private series in a Piper Cadet to go switch over to 172s. Uh -huh. So they, the equipment changed, and now we're going to be shooting. I'm sure we're going to shoot some more stuff because the G5s are getting put in all their trainers all their 172s at Sporties. So it'll look different. So we'll probably want to do some stuff that looks like updated six-pack, or uh, they just bought a 182. It's got a six-pack in it, but they're going to put G3X Touch in it and a 650 or a 750, I forget which. Boy, oh boy, I, I am just very fortunate that John Thacker and Ken Reeder were very, very insistent, if you will, that I go all one brand, all talking together, and I came to the conclusion along with those guys, John and Ken, that if I wanted to get to an air show and I had to fly hard IFR, I had to have a full panel that could handle that and not screw me up on workload trying to fly needles and yeah. uncoupled approaches if the workload or the weather got nasty. But, you know, as equipment changes, as, as rules change, uh, all of those things, we do updates all the time. Other than just the, you know, spot updates or updating for technology or this or that, are there any other series they're looking to develop or any other updates that you're aware of or could talk about? <laughs> well, actually, they have not. I said, you guys want to do a one on the G3X, and Garmin is already doing that. So, okay. So probably not, although I could do a heck of a job on, on that. I'm just, because I know <laughs> where to touch. Yeah. No, I know where it all works. Well, that's all really cool. Between the sporties updates and all the air shows that you do, you certainly are keeping busy, aren't you? With it, with everything that's going on, you know, I got 15 shows lined up for next year and 12, maybe 13 for 2024. I was going to try to keep it at 10. I promised Jill I would only do 10. She wavered me to 12 uh, <laughs> because, because of friends in the business. Yeah. And maybe a 13th. I don't know yet. Uh, but that and doing the I Laughed podcast or, uh, you know, that's keeping me plenty busy. That and, the, and, and audiobooks. I was working on audiobooks all afternoon, uh, a new book uh, by a guy in town here. When the folks at Flying Magazine approached me about that, I thought, man, this could really be cool. And now we've got 50, let's see, in the next couple of days, maybe, I don't know if it's today or not, dropping another episode with Wayne Boggs, the air boss, oh, yeah. uh, who's got an incredible story about flying in the Dominican Republic and winding up in the clouds without an instrument rating. Oof. And we are closing in very fast on 300,000 downloads in, in that short amount of time. So I'm thrilled with it, and Avemco is happy. And keep your fingers crossed, because I hope they're going to continue to sponsor it for next year, for all of 2023, and I would love that. I, I could not ask for a better fit. Lisa DeFries is the lady who uh, approached me about it, and she and Julie Boatman 
Lisa is the executive producer. She is one of the vice presidents now of Flying Magazine. And Julie Boatman is still editor-in-chief of Flying Magazine. And so editorial goes through both of them and then goes through uh, the folks at Avemco. And when they give it the rubber stamp and okay, it goes. So, But we're doing pretty well. I've, I'm learning what to do and what not to do uh, on that. And so I work down here, spend a lot of time right here. I've got a I got to write some stuff here very soon to get this next one up because I'm uh, my next guest is going to be Matt Youngkin. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah. He's got two interesting stories to tell. So it's amazing that people get themselves, even great pilots, get themselves in trouble every once in a while. Right. And uh, when they live to tell about it, uh, that makes the I laughed moment very, very helpful. So Flying Magazine almost every month gets a letter or two from somebody saying they read the column learned the lesson, got into a similar situation, and it saved their lives because of the lessons learned. It's almost missional what I get to do. Not yeah, just no. chat with somebody, but really hope to impart some good knowledge to people, myself included. So how did you get into the podcasting side of it? It, it was Flying Magazine approached you then? or That was, yeah, that they came out of the blue. I did not know Lisa, and she I think she emailed me. And then we we talked, and it, it was going to take a different direction. And she said, no. Then she came back and said, why don't we do, I learned about flying from that. I said, wow. And I considered, they said, how would you do it? I said, well, I'd do a tease, an opening tease. I'd do a quick commercial. I'd spend some time, four, five, six minutes with the, with the pilot talking about well, their aviation experience. Then we spend another 15, 10 to 15 minutes talking about what happened to them. And then I do another commercial and we do the last four or five minutes with the takeaways that I, what I learned about flying from that. And then, a, well, yeah. and uh, then a goodbye bye. And that's been the format ever since. The one thing that I did is I hired a guy to write some music for it. So the music that we have for I Laughed is all mine. Nice. <laughs> I got the copyright. I own it because I bought it. But it's it's good music, and it doesn't sound like anybody else's stuff. I laughed is is a lot of, it's. I mean, I spend probably eight hours per episode working on it. Well, I believe that interview. <laughs> yeah, there's editing yeah. that goes on. I'll reframe questions to make them more cogent because I I often I'm giving away trade secrets here. I often <laughs> will not have a specific question to ask because I know basically where I'm going with the whole thing, but the guest will say something and that will spark a question. And sometimes I stutter a little bit and sometimes I can clean that up and yeah, put a question in that elicits a better answer. The, the answer they give is better question to elicit that answer. You know, it's, it's it, kind of interesting because Jim does a pretty fine job of average at best <laughs> making, making the rest of, well, Maddie and I sound semi-intelligent. So, well, there you go. <clears throat> What what uh, DAW do you use? I'm using Audacity. Okay, because it's free and I'm cheap. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've got. I use Adobe Audition for the main recording, but I record on Riverside FM. I Ooh. just started using them, um, just as a test a, a week or so ago. I got some questionable audio back, but um, this guy that I talked to, I think it was you, <laughs> told me to try out the um, that Adobe AI audio enhancer. And well, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing too. Um, but the questionable, uh, the the thing that Riverside FM does, it doesn't clean up any audio that's coming from the other end. It just gives you a uninterrupted wave file in case there's yeah. a glitch in the internet. And so that's that's where I get. Even though I record in a Adobe Audition two track, but then I do all my mixing and master and mastering and editing in. Presona Studio One artist. So what is your most memorable or your most rewarding aspect in your career thus far? Maybe it's a personal note. Then I've done a bunch of things. And my oldest son told me once that he had said to some friends of his, my dad has reinvented himself three or more times. And I've gone from being an entertainer to an audio business owner to working at a church, being a video and lighting director, to an air show announcer, to voiceover and now audiobooks as I transition from air shows to audiobooks because I don't want to be doing air shows so many years longer that I lose my edge. 
right? Yeah. Little audiobook narrators who are in their 80s who are still working. Oh, yeah. I think the most rewarding thing is that my kids have taken notice, but that my kids have a work ethic which has made help them all to be successful. I have never been a time clock puncher. Because we work till it gets done. And that's the way my kids are. And it's, that's exciting. Gave my kids music. My first wife, Gail, gave them love and mercy. And so they're, they're better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole goal, right? Yeah. That's beautiful. That's kind of poetic, actually. Wow. This has been fun. It's been, a, it's been a fun time. It's been, this has been enlightening and I've had a lot of fun. Well, thanks guys. Me too. But we still need to hear one final question that Jim's been holding on to for the longest time. Oh, uh, geez. <laughs> he was warned about it. He knows what's coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, we are curious what your unpopular aviation opinion would be. Oh, that's, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say currently, based on what happened in Dallas, is that my most unpopular opinion is to tell the folks who are speculating as to what happened there in Dallas to shut the hell up. That's fantastic. I couldn't agree more. I know that that Spad McSpadden, Richard McSpadden from uh, Air Safety Institute at AOPA, has uh, has looked at things, and there's now a uh, a preliminary report. But the final report's going to be a it's a long way off, you guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's I I could come up with suspicions, but I have been so wrong when I have thought about things like that that I just tell them to shut the hell up. Even our podcast take when this first came out was that. You know, our take was going to be, we're not going to really dive too much into what may have happened. We're just going to pay our respects to the those pilots and the crews and the families and let the investigation take its course. And I think that there's not enough of that that goes on. Everyone needs to have them an opinion or, yeah, which is I, ironic, I know, because we're asking you for your opinion, but <laughs> <laughs> just well, in general, well, but good. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, but in that case, my, my opinion is that I have no opinion. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and other people shouldn't either. We shall wait for the final report, I suppose. Yeah, be a long time. And I don't think enough people say that opinion. So, I will thank say you. I'm a Lena Peak guy. So, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Along with Kurt Busch, right? <laughs> I I do Lena Peak, and uh, and what else do I do? Um, <laughs> and. I very seldom file a uh, VFR flight plan, but I had to do one, did a couple recently, and both times, first time I forgot to call and cancel. <laughs> the second time, nope. I was getting flight following, and I told the controller, I'm canceling the VFR flight plan, uh, I got the airport in sight, we can go ahead, and, uh, if you want, I'll squad 1200. He said, yeah, controller will not cancel your VFR flight plan for you. Nope. You got to do it yourself or do it on four flight now. So right. then I got a call from a guy. Hey, they called us. One of the guys from Sporties, Paul Jurgens. He said, uh, I told him you landed. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a very corny reference here, but did you learn about flying from that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, did. I learned a lot about flying from that. Like, you can't just tell somebody and a controller to cancel. You got to do it with flight service in yep. the air or on the ground, or whatever, or with ForeFlight. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on. Oh, it's been fun. Jim, thanks, Trevor. I appreciate it. Enjoyed you guys. I'm sorry Maddie wasn't around, but... Yeah, I'm sorry, too. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great night, all right? All right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Trevor. Have, we'll see you guys later. Have a Merry later. Christmas, all right? Thanks. Same to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. That was awesome. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in awe. Yeah? Here's the only problem with having a guy like Rob on, right? There are so many things I want to talk to him about. So many different directions we could have gone with that and made like a whole episode just off of one thing. But like he's even said that his son has said, you know, how many times has he reinvented himself and just as humble as can be and just a great guy to talk to. He'd be like one of those guys, you just sit down for a cup of coffee at the airport and just, you know, talk. Little hanger chats. Not little. Long hanger talks. Long hanger talks. (laughs) So coming up here is our one-year anniversary as a podcast, and to celebrate that, we do still want to try to do a live on December 30th. We'll be doing that at about 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Uh, Watch our social media for that. Can't make the live? Fear not, because our next published episode will be 
the recording of that live event, and we will publish that the first week in January. So what exactly are we looking for when we put this live event together? Maybe we each can talk about, well, Maddie doesn't freaking listen, but she's part of the interviews. We can each kind of think back to what were our favorite kind of guests or moments or what have you. It's also so hard to pinpoint like favorite moments. We've talked to some like really cool people this year. People that we've never would have otherwise talked to. Oh yeah. The opportunities that we've had. I mean this you know, and it's kinda it's kinda interesting when we start when we go back out to our very first episode when we you know, we, we tried a few different things, you know, CFI minutes, which yeah. you know, I, I I kinda wish we could bring back, but we just don't have the time for it. You know, our experiences flying, cold weather flying and then we then we fast forward to, you know, the women's round table for women yeah. in aviation. That was a pretty that was a pretty potent one. Nicole Mitchell was a phenomenal interview as well because I mean her her credibility, you know, working through Katrina and a few others and as an Air Force Reserve, looking at what she was able to accomplish over her career, military and civilian, and how how she kind of married that together as a as a as a female aviator. Twenty six episodes and it, it just it's hard to put my finger on which one was probably the best because there there's yeah. so many great ones. So with that said, though, in our next episode. We're celebrating our one year. So here's what we want to do. We're going to put on our social media as we publish this episode, the opportunity to come and chat with us. I know that we've had a lot of fun over the last year, but we want to hear some of your favorite moments over the last year. What was something that maybe stuck out to you? Something that maybe inspired you to do something with your aviation journey? Uh, We just want to hear how we've maybe been able to have an impact with others because that's kind of what this is about. I mean, we started out with us just kind of goof around having fun and you know, trying to have a Midwest feel while we talked about learning through aviation, but it's really been the springboard into these great conversations with great people around the Midwest. It really has. All right. So check out our social media. We're going to put some stuff out on that. We would love to have you come and join us and have a chat with us next Friday. Um, Absolutely. Celebrate our one year anniversary with us. We'd love to have you. Maddie better be there. Uh, Yeah. This is for you too, Maddie. If you're listening, Um, we'd love to have you. Make sure you come and join us. Expectation is you're going to be there. Oh, yeah. Just, we're telling you, you don't get a choice in this matter anymore. Nope. So on behalf of Maddie, Trevor, and I, we just want to wish all of you a very happy holiday season and a happy new year if you don't get a chance to listen to us before we jump into 2023. Until next time. See ya. See ya. Thanks so much for joining us on the Flying Midwest Podcast. Until next time, podcast service terminated, Squawk VFR, frequency change approved. Good day. Oh, I have permissions. I gave you permission. My hair looks terrible. What is what is going on here? Are you going bald? Oh yeah. <laughs> How bloated do you feel after that? Oh, I feel fine. Oh, last night though. Oh man, we were recording and what? I was uncomfortable. <laughs> um, like I ate so much food. Can you hear her crying? No, are you sad? Yeah, there you go. Sticker shock. Wait. Yeah. Or f- frozen. Frozen? That's a movie. Sticker. Sticker. Sticker show. Sticker frozen. Sticker frozen. Sticker freeze? Yeah. Sticker freeze. Okay. Ice cream freeze. I don't know. Oh, brain freeze. Brain freeze. There you go. <laughs> I'm sure we're going somewhere with this. Nope. <laughs> no. I just found an old pen. I'm sorry. I'm... Hey, congratulations. Hey, that sounds stupid. There's a lot of thudding above me that's very distracting. My kids are so heavy footed when they come down the stairs. They're just <laughs> thump, 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 thump. Rob, was you like that? I did. I thought it was great. And I, I forgot what I said. I, you'll hear it again when I put it in the episode. If you listen. He's also been heavy. Super content. Blah. I thought we were maybe light on it, so I... <laughs> Just drink a little water. Sounds like a water bong. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you know that um, 100% of all serial killers have um, used water in their life? It's a very dangerous substance. Does, does it mean I, I, I could be a serial killer too? If you do, I'll be happy to, to answer it and 
maybe even quote that one line out of Top Gun that we all remember when somebody is trying to blow smoke, and that response is, "Beautiful." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, we I'm, use that all the time in the military, so trust me. I'm familiar with that as well. So, <laughs> H2O was a key ingredient in rocket fuel. It's also a key contributor in all drownings. Hey, that should be a new podcast. Long hanger talks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exploring the rabbit holes with Trevor. Yep, right? That could be the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so until next time. With more enthusiasm, Trevor. Oh, I have permissions. <laughs>